In this video, I'm going to be going through section 1.6, which is function inverses. This is kind of a meaty topic, but we've distilled a lot of the really important information for Math 161 to make it not only palatable, but um, easily referenced throughout the course. You'll see us kind of going back and forth on this idea as we venture into different functions. Today, what we're going to do is uh, first, we're going to be given points of a function or an inverse function and determine points on its inverse function or the original function. Next, we're going to actually compute the inverse of a linear function. Then we're going to use composition inverse identity to check our computation for two. The third uh, objective today is actually going to be done at the end, um, just so that we aren't white wading into too much theory at the start of the lesson. And then we're going to compute the inverse of a nonlinear function requiring a domain restriction. In particular, we're going to be doing this with a quadratic. And that's all that you'll be expected to do in the course up to this point. First, we're going to define an inverse. Ultimately, what we're saying is if I take some number, a, and I use f to map it to b, the inverse function would take b and send it back to a through a similar mapping, but we would call that mapping the inverse. The inverse is typically denoted as f to the negative one of x, but we do not call it f of x to the negative one power. Okay, there's gonna be a homework question that addresses this because that's a really important thing to keep in mind. Um, another way that we could kind of think of this is if f of a is equal to b, then f inverse of b is equal to a. It sends it backwards. So if we think about a function, we take a point in its domain, a, and we send it to b by the mapping f. For an inverse function, we start with b and we send it back to a by the opposing mapping. So you could think of it as if f does something, then f inverse undoes something. So an important note, every relation has an inverse relation, but whether or not a function has an inverse function has to do with whether or not the function is one to one, which we talked about in 1.1. If a function is one-to-one, -one, it's going to have an inverse function. We're going to observe this later. So let's start with just kind of an intuitive way to think about an inverse. Suppose I had some function f of t, where if you told me the number of minutes that you've driven, I would tell you, my output, the number of miles you had driven in that time. What does f inverse of 70 mean? So what we would do is we could think about this as domain and range. Okay, we would take A, our number of minutes driven, and map it to our range value, which is B, the number of miles driven. So F inverse of A is going to be equal to B. So F inverse of 70, what does that mean? That means what number, when I plug it into my original function, gives me 70 as a Y value? Okay. So there's 70 in my y value. I want to know what its corresponding x is. b is going to be equal to 90. So f inverse of 70 is equal to 90. So think of it like if I were going to say, well, what's f of 90? You'd start with 90 in the t, and you'd map it to the y value, which would be 70. I'm going the opposite direction with an inverse function. Given that I have traveled 70 miles, I'm 90 minutes into my journey. This is obviously the reverse of the statement. Um, if I have traveled for 90 minutes, I'm 70 miles into my journey. So if I've got this function, it's g of x below. I want to find what g of 3 is and g inverse of 3. So for g of 3, what I'm really saying is what's the y value when x is equal to 3? Okay. So if I drew a vertical line at three, where am I touching the function? Well, the y value associated with that is one. Okay, now g inverse of three, that's a totally different question. What I'm saying is if I drew a horizontal line at y equals three, what's the corresponding x value? That corresponding x value is gonna be five. So suppose we had a function f and just think about this in your mind which doubled each input plugged into it and then added one to that result, okay? So imagine what would happen. So if I gave you five 
what would come out of this function. Take a second and compute that. So let's do f of five. That means I'm going to plug five in. I'm going to double five and add one to it. So two times five plus one, that should be 11. So f of five is equal to 11. That's our function. Now, from here, we could discern that f inverse of 11 is going to be equal to five. But what would that actual function be? So in order to think about this, there's one method of computing a function's inverse. And I think it's really intuitive, but students tend not to gravitate towards it. So I'm going to show another method in the next example. But for right now, I just want to show you how this one works. The first thing I'm going to do is determine the order of operations on x in f of x. So I'm just going to plug some x value in. I chose 5. There's nothing special about 5, but I'm going to plug it in. So I plug 5 into my function. And the first thing I'm going to do to it is multiply it by 2. And I'm going to add 1. So if I make these tables in f, the first thing I did to that x value that I chose randomly, there's nothing special about it, was 5. The first thing I did was I multiplied it by 2. And then I added 1. Now, for the inverse, it seems to make sense that the opposite of multiply by 2 would be divide by 2. And the opposite of add 1 would be subtract 1. Now, in f, I moved down the table. So it seems to make sense that in f inverse, I would move up the table. So I'm going to start with x. And the first thing I'm going to do is subtract 1 from it, because that was at the bottom moving up. And then I'm going to take that whole result and divide that by 2. This is going to be my inverse function. This is what's called an operations table. You can compute inverses, particularly with linear functions using this, but it's not a required method. There's another way to do it that we'll see um, on the next example. So there's an alternate method to doing this. The first thing we can do, so I've got this function negative 3 times x minus 2. I want to find the inverse. The first thing you can do is switch the x and y variables. So if I rewrite this as y equals negative 3 times x minus 2, I'm going to switch x and y. So now I have x equals 3 times negative 3 times y minus 2. The next thing I'm going to want to do is solve for y. So the first thing I'm going to do in this process is divide by negative 3. And so then I get negative x over 3 equals y over 2. Then I add 2 to both sides. And now I've gotten y by itself. I've solved for y. Now I'm going to use f inverse notation for my solution. And that's going to be another way I can solve this. So we've got the operations table, and we've got um, the xy switch. I wanted to show them both to you. If you use the operations table for this, you should obviously get the same result. It's going to look different, um, but you should get the same thing. Now, why do we ever need inverse functions? So if you travel abroad, you will find that finding the temperature for a given day can be a little weird. We are used to expressing temperature in Fahrenheit. Everywhere else in the world uses Celsius. Truth be told, Celsius makes more sense. But this is the world that we live in. You want to find the formula for converting Fahrenheit to Celsius. You've got this formula here. If you give me a Fahrenheit, I can tell you what it is in Celsius by subtracting 32 from it first and then multiplying by 5 ninths. So given that it's 75 degrees Fahrenheit, Betty wants to find out what the temperature is going to be in Celsius. So she plugs in 75 as F to find what the, um, degree, the temperature is going to be in Celsius. So the next day, the designer sends his assistant the week's weather forecast for Milan. Uh, you know, Milan, it's in Europe, France. I think Milan's in France. Uh, and asks her to compute the temperatures to Fahrenheit. So what you're going to do is determine and interpret the inverse function of C of F. I'm going to give you a second to do that. And I'm Googling where Milan is. Italy, wow, close but not. So we're going to start with C and what C inverse stands for. 
So for C, if I look at my formula for Celsius, I started by subtracting 32 from the Fahrenheit, and then I multiplied by 5 ninths. Obviously, the opposite of subtracting 32 is adding 32. And let's pretend I lived in a world without dividing, okay? Because dividing by 5 ninths is going to be weird. Let's instead multiply by the reciprocal. So I can think of this as multiplying by 9 fifths. So I moved down the table going from Fahrenheit to Celsius. So I'm gonna move up the table going from Celsius to Fahrenheit. So we start with F, we multiply that by 9 fifths, and then we add 32. And now this inverse function, what it's going to do is given the particular temperature in Celsius, I know it's denoted as F here, but that's just for variable consistency. It's gonna tell me what the temperature is in Fahrenheit. If you use the operations table for this, or I'm sorry, if you use the um, XY switch for this, you would have gotten the same thing. Now, for inverse functions, let's consider this quadratic function, okay? So every relation is going to have an inverse relation, but whether or not that function has an inverse function has to do with whether or not the function is one-to-one. -one. So what we're going to do here is we're going to restrict this particular function. And the rule is that we're only going to keep the function, the parts of the function, which are non-decreasing. So when I think about whether or not this is actually even going to have an inverse function, we know it's not because it's definitely not one-to-one. -one. See, if I draw this uh, horizontal line, I'm hitting the function twice, so we have a problem here. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to erase the part of it that's the part of it that's decreasing. I'm left with this hard point here at three because it's not increasing at that point. That's true, but it's also not decreasing, so that still fits in the world of non-decreasing. Now. I've got this function here, which we know about from transformations. I effectively took a quadratic function, shifted it three units to the right, so the input becomes x minus three, uh, and then I'm squaring that because it's a quadratic. Now, I want to find the inverse of this. So I'm going to do this again with operations table. If I were to take some x value, if I were to plug some x value in, say five, seven, whatever, the first thing I'm going to do to it is subtract three, and then I'm going to square it. The opposite of subtract three is add three, and the opposite of squaring, square rooting. So I'm gonna start with X, and the first thing I'm gonna do since I'm going up the table now, is I'm gonna square root. Now, I'm done with the square root, I don't need it anymore. Now I'm gonna add three, so I'm just gonna have plus three on the outside of it. Now, what does this function actually mean, and how does it interact with the original? We found the inverse, but what does it do? So, if we were to look at the graphs of both of these functions, in particular the um, restricted x minus three squared and square root of x plus three, we get this graph. Okay, the blue line is the inverse, uh, the red line is the original. This seems like a very natural sort of relationship. There is definitely a connection between these two graphs and it's gonna require a little bit of reflecting and flipping and whatever, but not really. I only need one reflection here. Let's say I drew, the, drew this line, and let's pretend that line was actually a mirror stood up. It would perfectly mirror both of those functions right on top of each other. That's called a line of symmetry. The function and its inverse have this graphical relationship. You could think of the inverse as a function turned on its side, but that's very imprecise language, and I personally uh, really love mathematics because of its clarity. And so I really want us to get into the habit of using clear and precise language. More succinctly, we would say this is a reflection about the line y equals x, which is our identity function from our toolkit. Now, why is this useful? So I can use composition for inverse checking. If I'm not convinced that my inverse function is actually an inverse function, there's this really neat relationship between composition and inverse that utilizes this fact here that it's reflective about the line y equals x by using compositions. So there's this really neat property where if I were to take an inverse function, put it inside of the original function, I would just be left with exactly x. 
which would be the same thing as if I took the function and put it inside of its inverse. Ultimately, if you take two functions and you do a composition of them, as we saw in section 1.4, if you took f of x and g of x and you put g of x inside of f of x, you'd get something. And then if you put f of x inside of g of x, you'd get something else, typically. When we, both, when we get the same thing from those, and they're both equal to x, that tells us something about those functions. In particular, they were inverses. So let's suppose I had these functions here. I had f of x and g of x. I wanna compute f of g of x, okay? So I'm gonna take g and put that on the inside of f. What does this tell us? Take a second, pause the video, and compute this for me. Do this composition. Make sure that you simplify. Okay, so we take g of x, that x cubed minus one, and we put it inside of f of x. The first thing that we see happens is the cancellation of the ones because these parentheses, there's no multiplication or anything, so we can just drop them. And then I'm left with the cubic root of x cubed, which is obviously just x. So that's interesting. I took this function, and put it inside of this function right here. And what I'm left with is just x. What this tells me is that these functions are inverses of each other. So let's suppose you're doing a homework problem and you compute the inverse of a function and you say to yourself, I don't know if that's it. What you can do is take that inverse function, use it as a composition inside of the original function and the problem I gave you, and see if everything cancels out except for x. If it's 2x or 3x or x plus 1 or blah, 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 it doesn't work. But if I just get exactly x from that result, that tells me that these actually were inverses, that my answer was correct. So we can use this to check our work, which is really useful. Now let's take a look at these two functions. Some of you will be able to look at this right out of the gate and tell me that these functions aren't inverses. But I'm just curious. Are they inverses? There's a way we can check. Let's take one of these functions and put them inside of the other. And if they are in fact inverses, what should come out is just the variable x. Take a second and try that. Okay. So if f of x and g of x are inverses of each other, then f of g of x should equal x or g of f of x is equal to x. We're just gonna go ahead and check f of g of x. We're just gonna check this composition. So everywhere I see an x inside of f, I'm gonna put g in its place. So I'm gonna distribute the three to both of those terms. I get nine x plus 33 minus 11. I collect these up and I get 22. So I get nine x plus 22. Well, guess what? It does not equal just x. Thus, these functions are absolutely not inverses of each other. Make sure that you're practicing the homework for this particular section. Um, good luck, and let me know if you have any questions, please.